Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writers podcast. I'm your host, Ruben Mendive. And today we have a brand new guest here for our third season, kicking it off. So with that, I like to have my guests introduce themselves. So your name and how you identify for the people at home. Yeah. So uh, my name is Francisco Cabrera Feo. Feo is my second last name, which is just a nice chip on my shoulder to uh, to humble me. Yeah, I'm a TV writer, Venezuelan American, bisexual, proud Florida man. So you sort of led me to my follow up question. Where are you from? So what's the short version? What's the long version that you tell people? Uh, I was born in Venezuela. I lived there for 11 years. In 2009, 11 years ago, I moved to the U.S. So that's the, the shortest version. Moved to South Florida. Uh, but yeah, so the longer version is, you know, I was born in Venezuela to these like fighters, what I would call them. I call my mother like a huge fighter. She was a lawyer, but then she started kind of fighting on the streets. I was born when Hugo Chavez took office. I never saw Venezuela without Hugo Chavez. So my mother was this giant activist that was at the forefront of you know you know how when you go to a protest there's the people that are at the front that want to fight the military and there's people in the back my mother always wanted to get into a fight while my father was in the u.s trying to prepare a home for us to move there yeah my mother would take us to the protest at like age nine and and it's probably not a space that i should have been at but my mother's like you're gonna be here and I, I talk about this a lot, but the, the image that I remember the most is her like painting her hands white at the protest so that they could see that we weren't armed, which is like a kind of a, it's, like I said, it's, it's one of those images that like so deeply is like ingrained in my brain. At 11, I moved to South Florida. I moved to Broward County, Pembroke Pines. I went to middle school there. I went to high school there. And yeah, I mean, I, I was a kid, a, a strange kid. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, but yeah, I wanted to be a mime and a magician and all these things when I wanted to grow up. Then I moved to the U.S. and all those dreams were like the strangest things you could have. I'm curious of like what you remember just growing up in Venezuela, just because, you know, I'm an immigrant too, but like I left super early. So uh, Mexico. So I'm just curious, like what what is like the memories of an 11 year old growing up in like another country? I grew up in a farm of in, in, in Valencia, Venezuela. Um, a very uh, a home that my parents built by hand um, with chickens and and many many cats I'm like not a cat person anymore but I, because I grew up with them but lots of animals you know there's a beautiful mountain um, and then we moved to the city and as a kind of a city kid there I had like a very cool brother older brother he was like what I remember is like rem inviting my friends over to hang out with me but then they would just end up hanging out with him because he was like the cool hot brother. I wouldn't call him hot. Other people would call him hot. That would be, that would be strange. Um, but uh, I feel like we were always at protest as kids. So I remember that very, very strongly. But yeah, when talking about wanting to be a mime and a magician and all these things, like I just wanted to be like a showman of a kid. You know, I would like sit my friends down and be like, I learned this new trick. Let me show it to you. Yeah, I guess I was just kind of loud and obnoxious and like look at me look at me if the world needs to look at me um which i guess hasn't changed a lot but <laughs> but that was i guess my my first 11 years there i'm also amongst other things like an ignorant american so i don't really know what's going on anywhere in the world so like explain to us like the situation in venezuela as you understand it growing up now like what what is like honestly like what is going on there that's a difficult question because I'm not currently connected to that experience. But growing up, what he meant was a president that never went away, right? I lived there for 11 years. We had the same president. I, even years later, we still had the same president. We didn't lose that president until, until he died. You know, he, he was basically like our monarch. But what I remember the most was how dangerous that country was. You know, it, it used to be, I think he's like, 2007, it was the happiest country in the world. 2008, it was the most dangerous country in the world. One of the things that I remember fighting for in those streets were, you know, this news channel that was being taken down by the government. They weren't getting their license renewed. So the only news channel that was kind of commenting on the president's flaws was losing its license. So that was RCTV. Uh, and that was one of those protests that my mother would take me, where it's like we were begging for like liberty of expression. 
libertad de expresión was something that I heard all my life. Um, and I remember sitting the last night that channel lived. I remember it was the cast and crews and the news anchors and everybody singing the national anthem as the midnight, as midnight came and it literally turned into a government run channel, like in front of our eyes. Midnight, it was 12.01. It went from RCTV to, I don't know, Benevision, something like that. Something very like government run uh, news channel where the way that my family was treated on the streets were never casted, right? The way that the violence from the military and from the government and the silencing and the lying that was never talked about. There was no longer a new station that really criticized that government. Let's talk about like your family's decision to leave and then like sort of that transition for you as like a kid. You know, I was excited. <laughs> I was excited because I mean, I grew up watching High School Musical. So I was like, I want lockers. That's all I want. America promised me lockers. And I was like, I'm going to go to America and go to Disney World and get lockers. And for my, you know, I think my brother was older. He was 15. So he did not want to leave. He had his friends. He has everything. And, you know, my mom and my father were leaving their family. We're leaving their lives. So even though, you know, like I said, I was this 11 year old. that was like so excited. I was like America. Right. And moving here, I think for me first, I didn't get lockers, which is very disappointing. Uh, I felt like the America had lied to me. I did not get lockers. My mother always felt like this was temporary. Like we're only here for a little bit. Mm. We're 11 years in and she still thinks it's temporary. I mean, we had to beg her to get her an American citizenship because she felt like she was turning her back away from Venezuela. That was her, her feeling about the U.S. My father was more of a dreamer. He was like, I'm going to give you Disney World and everything. And we get there and we realize things cost money and <laughs> we're not going to go to that, but we are going to go to the Sagras Mall. And, you know, that's a different experience. And my brother, you know, he looked for other Venezuelans in that high school. He looked for anybody else who kind of reminded him of home. For me, I was like, I'll take anybody who'll take me. <laughs> I was like, I just want friends. And he was very specific about continuing to connect to her home, his home country, where I was just desperate for anybody to take me in. Let's talk about like growing up in Florida. Like what, what's, how would you describe where you grew up to like somebody that's never been there? I mean, very residential. It wasn't, you know, it's not Miami. It's not like, it's not the beach. It's not, it's not what you see, I guess, in those movies. Uh, it's very little houses, picket fences, green, you know, green trees and whatever. But for me, you know, I went to a school that was like high school and middle school together. And it was very diverse. It was a very diverse school. But I guess for me, coming from Venezuela and, you know, I skipped a lot of the trauma porn of all the stuff we, we lived at in Venezuela because, you know, we try to keep it light. But um, seeing and experiencing some of that kind of horrific stuff that I, you know, we lived in Venezuela coming to the U.S., I felt like I was like forced to grow up. I felt like, you know, while all the kids were talking about Spirit Week and homecoming and all of these things. I was this 11 year old with like a cigar in my mouth being like, why is no one talking about the social, political, whatever, you know, I was that kid, you know, which made it very difficult to connect with anybody. <laughs> it, it, it made it, it was, I was a very strange, you know, sixth grader because my mind was somewhere else. I had seen other things, things that happened to us. Right. So, yeah. So what I felt was very pivotal when it came to me uh, in middle school and feeling like I was forced to grow up was that. I never ate lunch in the cafeteria ever, N middle school or high school. I only ate lunch with the teachers and the teachers were like the cool teachers that had like little sofas in their classroom and they didn't have overhead lights. They had little warm lamps and they like taught a push APS US history to these seniors. And I was the sixth grader hanging out with the seniors because then that felt like our age and our experiences had evened out. So those were the people that I loved. Those were the people that I could continue to learn from and had in my opinion at that time, felt like a safe space for me to fit in. You know, all the weirdos ate lunch with the teachers. All the weird seniors ate lunch with the teachers. You know, that's where I found kind of my safe spaces, which was in middle school and high school, only eating in those classrooms, never stepping foot in the cafeteria, because that felt like who's going to who's gonna let me in the table? Who's going to pick me? Who's going to make fun of the smell of my food, which is a very classic immigrant thing, but it absolutely happened. Who's going to make fun of I had this like alpargatas, like a Venezuelan, another Tom's in their queue, but 
when I was growing up, they were not cute. Um, and everybody had Jordans and I had Toms or like Venezuelan Toms. And those were the thing that people made fun of me for. So I was just like very clearly did not feel safe in the cafeteria. So those classrooms felt like home. Let's talk about the high school years when you were actually in high school. So my three famous questions are, who were you? Who were you pretending to be? And how do you think people saw you at this time? You know, I went to a different high school. Uh, I decided to go to a different high school because I knew that I wanted to get into TV production. And in the first school that I went to, they did not have a good video, you know, AV club type of program. So I went to a different high school. It was still a public school, but I very much clearly said, I'm going to the school for this. That meant being in the morning news. That meant making PSAs. That meant making little commercials for like the volleyball team selling chocolates. And that meant once again, eating lunch in that AV room. I don't know. I feel like the folks that knew who I was knew that I was like that TV kid. But most of the times, I don't think people knew who we were. You know, we were just in. A, mm-hmm. It's like, like I was cool in the TV room. I wasn't cool outside the TV room. It felt like its own little community, its own little hierarchy. You know, I was like the TV president, right? Like that was very much like the type of kid that I was. Through that time, the things that I was hiding, right, were my queerness. You know, the things that were a little bit in me that I was really scared to ever talk about, or that I thought I'm gonna put that away, put that away. Literally, I mean. <laughs> As hacky as that sounds, like pray the gay away was 100% something that I did. Literally pray at night that I wasn't gay or that I wasn't queer. The other side of that was my body was changing. And I was first, for the first time, I think my family was like, Francisco, quédate flaquito. Stay, you know, flaquito. Watch what you eat. Don't eat that. Don't eat that. And it became like a very, honestly, difficult relationship with food. I mean, my mother, she found some church ladies on Facebook that we're talking about diet pills. And I was like, oh no. So basically my mother got this strange diet pills from the people that she learned on Facebook to like test on a kid. Like I was having, you know how there was like a nosebleed kid. I was the fainting kid because of those diet pills who also had nosebleeds. So I was both. Um, It was a lot. Um, So yeah, I think high school was really, I think I was hiding a lot. I think I was, you know, I was talking to somebody from high school yesterday. And I realized like I was performing. I was very much like I'm I'm the TV kid, I'm the TV president, blah, 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 blah. But there was so much behind that. That was the way that I felt about my body, the way I felt about my queerness, the way I felt about my relationship to my family. You know, all these things were secretly behind it, but I very much came off as very confident. I knew myself. I was very sure of myself. It wasn't until college where all these things were like trickling down and I was allowed to feel those feelings hourly. Yeah. And so, you know, you mentioned that you were like the AV kid, the TV kid. So, and you went to a specific high school to sort of pursue that path. So I'm curious of like, where did that start? How did you even know, like, this is something that I'm purposely choosing to pursue? I mean, I mentioned it, right. I I always wanted to be a storyteller. Didn't matter what medium it was. If I could be like a young Luis Fonsi, I would have done that. You know, if I would, if I could be a David Copperfield, I would have done that. Uh, But I think my mother said no to everything else. Uh, she very much was like, not to this, not to this, not to this, maybe this. And that maybe was, you know, my, my brother got a job at a movie theater. So from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., I went with him and I watched movies back to back to back. That was like through all of high school and through, I think, most of middle school, too. So watching those movies back to back is not only how I literally learned how to speak English was through movies, but I also like fell in love with stories because even though I was this one kid in this theater, in this movie theater, I did not feel lonely. I did not feel alone at 11 a.m. on a Sunday (laughs) at a movie theater um, while everybody was at church. That felt like a start. I know that he loves when I say that story because he's like, you see, you see, you see, friend, I helped you out. I helped you out. But uh, it's true. I mean, that felt like home. Um, None of that meant I wanted to be a writer. I still, you know, I that came way later. I think I wanted to tell stories. But when it comes to like directing that's where it first started. Yeah. And so like, what did your parents do for a living? Like what, what were they up to while you were growing up? My father, I, I, I know this sounds terrible, but it's vaguely like import and export, whatever that means. That's just something he told me. And I don't think he ever explained it. Um, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't even say that out loud. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, my mother had this journey of being this badass businesswoman 
and activist and fighter in Venezuela. And then, you know, she comes to the U.S. and she becomes like her biggest nightmare, which is a housewife. You know, she tells me that she's like, yo, you know, yo tenía amigos in Venezuela. I had friends in Venezuela. I had, a, I had a career. I had everything. And now I'm here and I feel like, like a trophy, like a trophy wife in the worst sense of her. I mean, it's interesting. She told me that. And then I brought it up to her and she said, I never said that. It's like, oh, mom, you, you did say that. Um, we're going to act like you didn't say that. I'm going to say on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think that was her journey. I think she's trying to get back to herself now that she doesn't have to take care of us that much because she deserves that. She deserves to be her own, not, not be, I think, my father's wife, right? be her own self um because she always was and she was like i said she's still somebody that inspires me so much so when she was here and she is here i think she didn't work for a lot for a lot for a lot of the time where my father was trying to continue to work with venezuela until venezuela completely went to shit that's the best word that i can say it completely economic wise they were not there was no way and my father lost his job And he did not tell us. <laughs> he told my mother. My mother knew. But I think what my father does is that, like, he's never going to tell us that we're struggling. You know, he's never going to let us know, which also meant he was going to poorly use our, the money that we did have. So, yes, I just got unemployed, but I came home with a new TV. My mom's like, please return this. Like, we can't. What, do you, what is this? So the, I think that was my experience was that my father had this great job that brought us to the U.S., And then that job went away. And my father now is trying to get new jobs while also not being able to speak English. You know, he now I think he opens up more, but he would tell me that like he had a presentation, he practices English, he practices everything, and he shows up, he does a presentation, and then goes and like, and I'm, I'm wearing everybody's laundry here, but he goes to the car and cries. Like, goes like his lunch break was him crying in the car. I don't know. I feel like. This immigrant parent, sometimes when we look at it in television or in film, they, they're almost like archetypes mm -hmm. where, where it's like the macho dad and the, you know, the fight, you know, and I think getting to see so much depth from my parents and a three, three dimensional, you know, being a fighter and an activist and a lawyer to somebody who wants to regain that or my father who would never let us know that he was struggling until he had to tell us, right? They have so much stories to tell us, and I and I I thank them so so deeply for giving us so much. It's same with my family, you know. It's like that's the part no one talks about. Like it's always like the good immigrant mentality. It's always like the good, hardworking like immigrant parents. They sacrifice everything, and I think people sometimes say that gloss over it. It's like and it's like no, it's hard coming to another country. It's hard rebuilding it with kids. Try to like figure it out, and like no one's really looking out or trying to help you. So. Yeah. No, I mean, they're people, right? It's not just that they're mom and dad, right? They're people who have their own stories, who have their own journey, who still cry in the car, who still want to be something when they were once something, you know? I, I think that's, I think growing up, you look at the, I, I looked at them as being this perfect parents, right? From afar. I'm like, these are my dad and they always know what's, they always know the answer. They always know what's the right step to do. Growing up now, I'm seeing them and seeing them as people and seeing them as flawed humans and seeing their faults and not their faults, but their weaknesses. And how can I feel those so that they can feel, you know, more supported? It's like me trying to support them now instead of them trying to support me. Yeah. So let's talk about what you did after high school. Like, did you have a plan? Did things go according to plan? I had a wild kind of senior year uh, in high school. I made a short film uh, that was called Revolving Child. Uh, and it's about this little girl that finds a gun in her house. And with that gun, she wants to stop the memories of her past. So it's just kind of this dark kind of magical realism thing. I wrote and directed it and we wanted to make this film and we didn't have any budget for it. We obviously, I mean, we were in high school and, and my high school wouldn't let us use the equipment for it because it was like a political, it was too like political of a, of a short film. So then we did like a fundraiser, uh, like a chicken wing restaurant where we bring people in and then 15% of The, the money that they make that night that would give to us because uh, it was like a tax write-off. And then we did like a small little crowdfundme before like Kickstarter and all this stuff, I think existed. And we made this short film in like three days. The luck of the world is that I made this short film and Mark Duplass and John Legend were like, you know, this little tiny little project you made, 
let's bring it to the Toronto International Film Festival. And I was like, I was blown away. You know, I was a 17 year old kid. I applied for this kind of competition where they would pick it. But I applied when I was 17, which broke the rules of the of the competition. But I was I knew that I was going to be 18 by the time we were in, in Toronto. So they pick this film, they bring it to Toronto and it feels like the big break. Right. It feels like, oh, my God, I'm going to be this is it. Right. When you have Mark Duplass and John Legend looking out for you and they're trying to show this movie in the, in the Toronto International Film Festival where La La Land premiered the night before, like, whoa, everything's changing, right? And it did, but it also kind of blew my head up, right? I was like, I don't need film school. I don't need anything. I'm going to go to LA and be the 18-year-old kid who, whatever, has us, you know, I was trying to be Lena Dunham, basically. Um, <laughs> or like Issa Rae, but at 18. And, you know, I think my parents said the only thing that immigrant parents, I don't think I've ever said, which is go to film school. You need to go to film school. What I've always heard is like this immigrant parents being like, no, you can't do this. You can't do this. No, my parents are like, you need to go to school and you need to go to film school. And going to film school completely opened me up, you know, completely. I went to uh, Florida State Film School, which is where uh, Barry Jenkins went and like a lot of um, West Ball who did the Mace Runner films. It was a great program it's only about 11 of us uh 11 production students and 11 um 11 animation students and it's this kind of project-based learning where you're making 11 to 13 films a year and you're do you're one day i'm directing the next day i'm pa passing out food one day i'm the producer the next day i'm the script supervisor the next day i'm a pa the next day i'm a second ac so i got to do everything and then my giant head realized holy shit I have so much more to learn and I don't want to do it by myself. I want to do it with these great creatives that I love. And obviously I think a very classic journey of college was finding myself, right? <laughs> like that's a very thing people say. And it was true. I made a queer out person for the first time. I had like known of queer people from afar. I had known of Ricky Martin, right? I, <laughs> I knew, I knew of queer people, but I had never met somebody who was so freed and so open and, I saw that you could be queer and have a future. So when I saw that, everything stopped and it was like, holy shit, you're allowed to do that? I thought it was just going to be a thing I pack away. So seeing that completely opened everything up. It completely like, I mean, I was in Tallahassee, which is the capital of Florida, which is not a very queer city or anything like that. It's in the north of Florida, but it's in the south, if you know what yeah. I mean. I mean, I always talk about there's 11 gay people and we all know each other. There's one bar that's gay, but only on Thursdays. If I hadn't gone to college and I had just come to LA at that age, I wouldn't have known that there was so much of me that I was allowed to be. How does like a 17 year old like sort of decide to make a short film and then also be like, oh, and I'm also going to start submitting it to places because there are people at graduating college who are now just being like, oh, how does this all work? So how did like 17 year old you sort of already know, could sort of see the path? You know, I did grow up in a time where YouTube was my my classes, right? YouTube told me that I could go to festivals. YouTube told me that I could make films with my phone. I came from a place where my family loved movies. They they loved Venezuelan movies. They loved watching television. They loved so much of that. And I think being in a TV program, you know, kind of the AV TV club that encouraged, you know, kids to submit things is a privilege. I 100% know that. I think that's how I knew was because YouTube told me I could do it. And then my teachers helped me do it. So I was very lucky. And my parents were supporting me through the whole journey. It's an insane, insane privilege. I think that's how I knew that I could do it is because I had a community of people that, that did. And I think even making that short film and having these industry folks see it and pick me it felt like, oh my God, they're seeing something in me that I do not see in myself. They're seeing it before anybody else has pointed it out. That has always been a constant throughout, you know, years later, you know, whatever, six years later, is that I still feel like I've had people who have really seen me and seen that I'm like dying to break in or dying to, to tell stories and to tell my story. You know, how you first got on my radar just as like a filmmaker and sort of got like a first view of your storytelling. 
I went to go see your film here in LA. It was a screening at Outfest, I feel like, like the Latinx branded screening or whatever. Saw the film, loved it. So I, and the film was called Junior. So I'm just curious of like the journey to making Junior and then sort of what you were able to like build from it. Now that I had met a queer person for the first time when I was 19, I was like, what if 12 year old me had met someone? What if they had come, this had come five years before? How frightening and freeing that could be. That's exactly why I wanted to make Junior. It was giving myself the queer person I needed, the example, the representation, right? The freedom that I needed when I was way younger. I was like rewriting a little bit of my growing up. So making that film was also me making something while I was still in the closet. That was really frightening. I was making something that I knew that even though my family had spent all their life supporting my films, this was going to be the one that they couldn't. So that was so frightening to make every day. I mean, every day I would cry (laughs) making it or every day I would tell the crew that like this means I'm doing it with fear, but I'm doing it with pride. I wanted to do it with magical realism. I wanted to do it with so many other ways to, to tell this story um, in a way that I hadn't done before. So making that film and submitting it to Outfest and Outfest was the goal, right? Outfest felt like, what is the gayest festival that I can submit it to? And then I submitted there and we got in and, and to show it there, you know, we had shown it other places, but to show it at Outfest where the queer nuances, the shirtless Justin Timberlake in the background or like the Jonas Brothers in the corner, it got the laughs that I wanted to get. Cause that he, you know, the main character saying, I'm not gay, but in the background is a shirtless Justin Timberlake. It's like, oh no, I just like him for his music. You know, <laughs> that's me with like a Justin, Justin Bieber or Jonas Brothers poster in my room is I love them for their music. But we all knew that what <laughs> that meant, right? But it, it's not all of us who knew that because I showed it to an audience that was mostly straight and, and didn't get any reaction. And then I showed it at Outfest which I knew it was an audience that was mostly queer. It like it was such an incredible experience because they got it in a way that nobody else had gotten it. Yeah, and you know, that's what struck me about the film too. It's a very powerful film. It's only like, it's, I think it's maybe like seven minutes long or eight. Like there isn't a ton of dialogue in it. Like it's very like visual based. And I think it, I mean, definitely shows your skills off as a director, as a storyteller. But also like, I think it definitely takes a certain amount of like, emotional maturity to be like to already at the age you were then to like be processing like that sort of like shift that you yourself experience and then sort of relay that into your art also to like do the thing afraid like because you mentioned at the screening it's like it's like your parents maybe weren't totally aware what was going on with this film or where you were what you were doing it does take some like bravery to like present your artwork and then also be speaking to a crowd of it while you're still figuring the thing out, you know? I mean, I th- yeah, I think I, I said at the screening, my parents don't know why I'm in LA today. And that was true. That was super true. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> also, during that time, like the whole reason I knew of the screening and sort of who you were was because you're like the unofficial, like boy king of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. And, that, and listen, pleasantly surprised that when I did see your film, I was like, oh, and he's talented. Like, his Twitter is all talk, but like, you had the goods to back it up. So I am curious of like your Twitter journey. Like, can you take us from the star humble beginnings and then to this like mega star that you are today? That's very nice. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm a mega star. Not until I get that blue check. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where is it? Where is that blue check? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But it's interesting. I think once I, once I started Twitter, it was always self-promotion, 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 which, and it was kind of egotistical in that way. You know, it's not till I found out that I could also be myself. It's not till I found out that I could make the dumbest jokes on that app. And I stopped taking myself so seriously. I mean, talk, you know, in the past minutes that we've talked about, like it's been so kind of dramatic, but I, I write comedies, which is wild, you know? Um, when I stopped taking myself so seriously is when I have, found, when I was able to find that community and that support, I also was putting my films out on online very, I know I was not scared of like, Oh, who's going to see this. 
I think something I learned very early is that like the work that you share doesn't have to be perfect. People just need to see that you're getting better. And they also need to say there's potential there. A lot of people have invested in me and have supported me, not because I was great, but because they saw that one day I could be. And that's always felt so important because usually I'm like, I'm not going to share this because it sucks. Right. I think we all do that. Or like, I'm not going to post this because it sucks, but it's like, yes, a lot of my stuff did suck, but there was like maybe one scene that was really strong, you know, even a film like Junior, which is something that I'm very close to and that I'm very proud of. I'm still like, Oh, I could make it better. I could, you know, there's ways that I could make this better. But then there's one scene where we show queerness as magical realism through light through slow-mo, through, yeah, through kind of the light that comes out of you um, and that reflects into somebody else and doesn't make any sense unless you've seen the movie. But that was like, that is that is special. Everything else could be flawed, but if you have like one 10 seconds that is really great, I think people can see that you're trying your hardest to make the best art that you can at your level. So I was not ever scared of sharing my work on Twitter. And I, that's how I got to, I think, get that support. I would not call myself the boy king of Twitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's very sweet and also frightening but uh but i mean there's such a giant twitter writer community there like the writers that have taught me how to take a, a staffing meeting from twitter the writers who have connected me to their managers from twitter the writers who have sat down for coffee with me because of twitter it became a connecting tool while also making a lot of inappropriate jokes that i think will one day haunt me so yeah, so you know, I am complimenting slow and low key teasing you about Twitter, but I think that is why you do so well on that platform. I think you're right. You are yourself. I think also like people respect the journey. They see the journey. We're all on the journey. So then when you see someone so publicly talking about it and figuring it out, people also see the tenacity, the talent, you just being a young person who had it figured out a centimeter more than any of us ever did. But and I think that's what is also people relate to it's like they see themselves in you and everyone remembers when they were graduating film school and they were trying to move to LA and everyone remembers how hard it was and I think you have found like a good place on Twitter where you're the community you're part of the community of it where it's less comparing it's less like hot takes or whatever but it's more about the journey we're all on together and I think that's why you've been rewarded with it so well because you you're all in on the community and i think when you do that and you do that for others i think it they only give it back to you and i think like i think I'm, I'm like an actual fan of folks i'm a fan of this podcast you know i'm a fan i'm like a real fan so i think like there's that whole like play it cool you know like <laughs> playing it cool like oh no you know but no, we're making television. We're making short films. We're making movies. Like that is still exciting. It is not a day. I mean, it's a day job. Yes. But it's also like, I don't know. I think I'm, a, I don't know how to word it. I think I'm still a fan of it. I'm a fan of people that are like, whose writing I love. I also see so many people who are extremely talented and I'm like, why isn't the world giving them their flowers? You know, yeah. let me, let me do that. If nobody else is doing it, let me use my little, my, my, my quote unquote following to spotlight somebody before anybody else had because a lot of people did that to me right before anybody else had seen me some people said invest in this kid and if i can do that and like give that back constantly it's like the best yeah you know and i was just talking to somebody about this i think everything that we struggle with in this industry as a community and i think it's like for me always the solution has been community like and i think you're right i think you have been like a fan of people. And that's what we're all sort of like waiting for. We're waiting for someone to like sort of see us and like appreciate what we're doing and see the talent and the potential. And I don't know, for, and I think that's sort of like one of the things we have to overcome. It's like, for some reason, there's a block for us for that. And I don't understand it. And I think we're all happy to like tweet in the Heights and gas them up. And I'm like, also that's your PR team's job. So like <laughs> the people that don't have that, maybe do that for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've spent the last week reading scripts. You know, I I wrote, I was like looking for comedy scripts from like pre-WJA writers because my manager was like, do you have any recs? And I was like, fuck, I haven't read enough scripts. So, you know, I just, I was just like, anybody want to, I was like, Twitter. I was, it was, it's always too much. Uh, I'm like, no, no, too many, too many replies. But like Twitter, I'd love to read your scripts. So I read so many wonderful scripts the past week that I'm like, 
trying to, and this is not talking, I'm just saying how we can use that Twitter as a tool to help others. I was just like, I'm looking for comedy writers who are pre-WGA. I got to read some of the scripts and send them over to my manager. Or I w- I'm like, I'm looking for bisexual TV writers. I was able to some, grab some of those folks and put them on this Netflix project that I've been working on. Like all as a way of like crowdsourcing and like community engagement and like find the folks who are like hungry and ready, just like I am hungry and ready. I mean, I haven't <laughs> quote on, you know, I haven't, it's still a work in progress. Um, I don't, I, I just, I guess people have the fear of being like, well, I'm going to help people once I make it where it's like, no, no, you can help people now. Like you can support people right now before you have a TV show. Like you can help people exactly right now with your means, which for me meant like I got a job and I was like, I'm going to use a percentage of this job to like uh, help crowdfund some people's films or I'm unemployed, but maybe I can do like a Twitter thread of people of scripts that I love shit like that you don't have to like wait till you're like the showrunner or the gatekeeper to help i think you can help people as you're growing you help people around you yeah you know and that's what i always tell people anytime i'm like in front of a crowd i'm just like listen i'm just a dude who was like frustrated and like felt very alone in this industry and decided my avenue was a podcast like we all have a version of that so your version doesn't have to come out weekly but you get there's we could all do something and and it costs us nothing. I had a Sony exec ask me if I was on your podcast. Like folks are listening and folks are like, they wanted to get to know me before I like got on to a general with them. So they asked, oh, how do we, how I like, are you in this podcast? So I can just like get to know you a little bit. So you're doing the work. I mean, it's, it's, it's reaching the right people. And, you know, I'm glad, you know, that's, that was the original intent of the podcast. I think now the intent is just more we all need to get to know each other like 100 like same thing when anytime someone reaches out to me or anybody's like tweeting out i need this person it's like why don't we already have that knowledge so like let's let's all be talking let's all like be actually meeting each other and because that's how it's gonna get done so we talked about junior we sort of talked about like twitter and i think i'm very curious of like what happens what's the plan what's what are you thinking when you're graduating film school because because that's a big thing a lot of people that is truly step one most of the time. So like, well, what have you been able to build from that and sort of like expand outward? I graduated in the middle of a pandemic, right? I think we spoke early in that process and I was sad. Yeah. But I mean, I, I was, I think I had the plan, right? I was like, I'm going to move to LA the second I graduate. And then, you know, the world laughed at me. Um, and I had to go back, live with my parents where I didn't even have a bedroom. You know, I was living in the, in the living room because they had moved so because they were <laughs> bachelor not bachelors they were they didn't they weren't parents anymore you know so yeah. they moved to a place where I, I didn't have a bedroom so i went back home and i also like it also meant feeling like the 15 year old closeted kid again to be mm-hmm. back home yeah. i remember i was watching love victor under the covers like i was 15 again truthfully so being back home was really difficult but i think i knew what my blind spot was and what i wanted to do i wanted to write for television really bad and I knew that my film school, although great at some things, did not teach me anything about TV. So then I was like, I'm going to meet anybody who's ever written in TV ever. And I met with some writers using Twitter. I met with some writers from Grace Anatomy, some writers from from Love, Victor. I met with Marvin uh, Lemus from Hentified. I met with as many people that could just give me advice and can tell me, what should I be doing? Because right now I'm just sad at home and i'm trying to find escape an escape out and that escape i was writing and writing my sample and writing the script that that got me in the door you mentioned earlier that like writing came sort of later to you so like when was that shift to be like where you sort of went from mr director and doing that film route to then being like oh i want to focus on writing and tv specifically i didn't realize that all the films that i was directing i had also written You know, for me, writing was a vehicle for directing. I never realized, oh, shit, like I wrote these scripts also. So I was writing, but I wasn't calling myself a writer. I think I didn't call myself a writer for a very long time. But that shift came when making movies was not possible. Where It's literally almost a a year or so ago. Making movies was dangerous because of COVID. So what's the thing that's free and safe for the most part is writing. So I literally just focused on my biggest weakness which was my writing. 
and I wanted to perfect it and I wanted to polish it. I did 26 drafts of my sample. I took everybody's notes. Then I made, you know, my friend Carlos Cisco, who was in the show, um, he said, you took everyone's notes. So you were making a horse and you got a camel because I wanted to please everybody. And I said, Mm -hmm. I said, if I take everyone's notes, I'm going to please everybody. And it turned into a camel instead of a horse. And then I had to go back to my first draft and be like, what made me love this, this script in the first place? So through those months of the pandemic, I tried everything that I could to make this script good and learn it. I watched, you know, not only did I meet with all those writers, but I also watched, you know, Shonda Rhimes masterclass and Aaron Sorkin's masterclass and all this stuff. Like I was just like, I know that my biggest flaw is my writing at that time. How can I make sure that I catch up with everybody else around me? I was very happy to hear that you got a job on Hentified. How did that happen? Walk us through it. I had built the sample that I had worked so hard on. And Marvin Lemus from Twitter and from in person, he had kind of given me slow mentorship throughout film school and throughout, you know, I met him at like a, one of those like networking mixers. And then we had tacos and then we like would DM and then we would like email each other. And then finally, when I had done 26 drafts of the script and I was like, how do I make this better? I shot my shot and I was like, Marvin, I know this might be too much to ask, but would you want to give me notes on the script? And he was like, dude, fuck yeah. Send it over right now. I'll read it. And so I sent it over. He gave me great notes. Uh, He gave me great feedback. I learned a lot through that process. And he was also like, whenever you move to LA, I got you. And I was like, okay, Marvin, I'll try to take you up on that word. But people say that people always say that. And I don't believe it until it happens. But then I moved to LA and I took a picture of my tacos and I put LA on like my little Instagram story location. And then he texted me. He's like, do you have a job? I said, no. And then he said, okay, do you want to be my personal assistant for two weeks? And I was like, yes, absolutely. I didn't even have a car. You know, I feel like a personal assistant is like all delivering gifts and shit. I didn't have a car. I didn't tell him I didn't have a car because then he wouldn't have given me the job. (laughs) So he doesn't need to know that. So I I used all the money that I was getting as a personal assistant to get Ubers to deliver the the, the gifts. And, you know, it was whatever I could do. And I also like did 300%. Like there was what was asked for me. And then there was, I knew that I was proving myself because season two was coming up in a couple months. So I need to make sure that I'm the best assistant so I could be a writer's assistant. And that's what I did. I did that. And I, then I applied for a writer's assistant job, um, which I then found out that it was a script coordinator job also. <laughs> and that job is extremely difficult. But through some learning and through, you know, talking to Raul Martin, who you, you have on this podcast, who taught me how to be a script coordinator, talking to Jen Gomez, who taught me how to be a script coordinator, they prepared me so, to do this job. So that when I was doing in that interview with Hentified, I was like, trust me, if I get anything wrong, I know who to call. You will never have to know that I messed something up. I got that job. I became the writer assistant through a writer assistant and script coordinator through the writer's room. And then as luck would have it, um, they were very much like, there's no hierarchy here. If our assistants have the best pitches, then they get to pitch. So then we, Steph O was a short assistant, close friend. And I was a writer assistant. We would start pitching and we would like text each other. Be like, oh my God, that was great. Good job. <laughs> you know, we were the, the support staff was really supporting each other. After a while, they took me to the side and they were like, we would love to offer you to write, to co-write an episode. And obviously my mind, you know, blew up. I mean, it was incredible and it was so life-changing. It still is life-changing. You know, they gave me that big break. They gave me, you know, my WGA card, you know, they, I was a writer. I had my little IMD credit. I got my manager because of that. I was on set. You know, I got my second job because they gave me a shot. All of those things came from them knowing that like, one, I was proof myself, but also they get to give this to somebody mm-hmm. and they get to mentor somebody through it. And they did just that. Yeah. And so you mentioned you were like fresh out of film school and now you're at the Hentified Writers Room. So I'm curious of like the like dream experience of like, oh, this is what it's going to look like. I can't wait to do it. Like everyone's so eager to get in this rooms. And then like, what did it actually look like? What did some things that surprised you, like some things that they didn't teach you that you were like, oh, like, because now you're seeing the sausage getting made. So like, how did Hentified sort of like give you like that info? It was interesting because, because it was the first time we were doing virtual rooms, 
you know, the whole room was through, because of the pandemic, the whole room was online. When it came to like boarding things and like putting things on the board, it, we were all learning together. And I was just like, I had like three screens because like Netflix had delivered us like monitors. And I had like three screens with like two keyboards and literally me, like it felt like I was a hacker. I had so much and kind of run the virtual board, but also write all the notes. I think what I learned the most is that we could all bring the pieces of ourselves to the story. I guess in my head, I was just like, oh, the showrunners know exactly what's going to happen. And we're just kind of working for them. No, they were very much open to like, what what would you like to see in the season? What are the characters that you'd like to see grow? What are, you know, how do we fix this, this moment? What do we make this episode about? Hey guys, I'm having a hard time with this episode. Can we re-break it in the room together? Then can we punch it up in the room together and all come, all everybody come up with bits and we're just spending a whole day coming up with jokes. Like that's a dream. It was so welcoming. It was so loving. I think I had listened to podcasts about writers from before. And I think I was, everybody was like, there's a giant hierarchy. The staff writers can't speak. The writer's assistants should never talk ever. Like <laughs> there was so much fear that I thought I had to come in with. And I had with me. Cause I was like, Oh no, I shouldn't talk. I shouldn't talk. I shouldn't talk. But they never led with fear. They led with love and laughter. And they trusted me so much through that process. So yeah, I think I expected fear and I got a welcoming environment. You are in LA, you have like, you know, the dream job everyone wishes they had. So like, what were you able to build from that experience at Hentified? Because I was in LA and I was basically in the COVID bubble. I got to be on set, you know, I got to be on that set for the episode that I wrote. I got to have a chair that said, the chair didn't say writer. My little mic said writer, uh, but I got to have a chair and then my little headphones said writer and I got to bring up, you know, Marvin was a director for it. So I got to pitch jokes and be like, can we try this one? Can we try this one? I got to rewrite on the spot because something wasn't working or was working. Um, that was such an incredible experience that I think through that process, I was very vocal about on Twitter about what every day felt like. I was very much like chronicling what it felt like to be in the room, what it felt like to have a joke, but not know how to pitch it, what it felt like to send a draft out as a script coordinator at 2 a.m. I was very vocal about my experience. So I think people saw that I was doing the work. And that's when I got like a phone call from like a manager that's like, hey, what about working with me? And we were like, we met a couple of times and I wanted to make sure that it was the right fit. But if it wasn't for Hentified, I wouldn't have gotten that rep, right? And through that process, I met some more folks at Netflix, which is how when I finished Hentified, I got to work on another project through Netflix for like queer Latinx pride, uh, which should be coming out the month that this comes out, <laughs> which is also today is my birthday based on when we're going to release this. <laughs> yes. Hi, it's my birthday. So I got to work on those projects that were so special. I think I spent so much of my time in college thinking that my voice and my stories and my Latinx experience did not matter, did not fit in, did not deserve to be told. That going from a place that made you feel like an outsider, then getting to work on Hentified, which was brown, queer, bilingual, as a first experience, it felt like I no longer had to code switch. It felt like I not only, I not only had, to, had to explain myself. And then going from that to another queer Latinx project, and hopefully, fingers crossed, I get to work on another Latinx project soon. It was like I spent four years in a predominantly white school that told me I did not matter. And then I went to a place that told me all the parts of you matter. Um, and that was a dream. It continues to be a dream. You know, I'm famous for saying the first two years in L.A. are the hardest. But if you can sort of tough them out, you you know, you sort of have a small victory. So I'm just curious of your version of that. It, it, it's very unique, but I'm just curious of like, how what has your experience been of the the L.A. of it all? You know, like coming to a new city, like figuring out like where you're going to live, like all that shit. How, what was that experience like for you? I spent all of college visiting LA because I was like, I love this place. I love this place. Any weekend that I could, you know, I, I used to work at Vice. So Vice had an office in LA. So and every weekend that I was free, they would like, luckily, incredibly, they would fly me to LA to be. So I got to be here and love it so much that when I moved here, I felt right at home. What was difficult for me has been the, and I don't know if I can attribute this to LA, but just like the culture, which is like, what's your next thing? What's your next thing? What's your next thing? Doing six months of, of Hentified and then 
saying, oh, I'm going to take a break because I've been doing 13 to 16 hour days. And I'm like, oh, this week I'm going to take a break. I'm going to slow down. And then feeling like, oh, no, if I don't follow this momentum, it's all going to stop. So then I didn't take a break. So then it was like a two months, two more months of working nonstop. And literally it was, this is the first week that I told my reps that I'm like, just imagine I disappeared this week. Mm -hmm. I, I'm all booked up. Imagine that I literally do not exist (laughs) because I need to slow down. I need to rest. I mean, I really hadn't been outside because I was doing, you know, all the Hentified stuff was, I'm in LA, but I'm in my office or I'm in, or I'm in a little cubicle or I'm, I'm, I'm in my bedroom. So truthfully, I could be in Florida. It is now where I have chosen to stop and said, slow down Francisco, because this is about the long game, right? You're talking about the two years. Thinking about two years right now feels, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that sounds like. I don't know what that looks like. I don't see it right now. So I need to slow down and be careful because I need to be able to see what two years looks like. And because I have this thing since I was in high school of like, push, 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 never stop. I feel like either I'm going to burn out or I'm going to fly too close to the sun and everything's going to go away. So I just need to be careful with myself. And I think I'm not blaming LA for that. I just feel like I remember the first day, you know, after the second project, um, this queer uh, pride project, I sat down in my couch and I was like, I'm going to just sit here (laughs) and enjoy having nothing that's due. And then crawling back is like, Francisco, tweet that you're unemployed and you're looking for a job. (laughs) Or crawling back feeling, oh my God, you have all those all those scripts that you have to do. I mean, yeah, I think it's, I'm not blaming Lay for that. I'm blaming, I'm blaming myself for not slowing down. And now I need to slow down and be responsible with my mental health. And also, but you're available to work at any time. Just yeah, so. I'm available to work. Just so you know, if you're listening to this, hopefully I'm not available when you listen to this. <laughs> hopefully you're listening to this and I'm all booked up. Obviously those, having those jobs and taking those jobs is amazing because we are in a pandemic. It's a privilege to be employed, but I think there's always a balance of, yes, you get to work while folks are having a hard time, but you also have to make sure that you are not ignoring your hard time because you're working. So, you know, we've talked about a lot about your journey and, you know, hentified, but I am curious about like your own writing. Like, what are some of the themes that come up in your writing? Like sometimes as writers, we tell the same story over and over. So what's the through line? What are stories that are attractive to you and that you're currently cooking up? Yeah. So right now, you know, when, when I came out, I had the worst experience in the world. And then I I thought I lost everything. I mean, my family said, you're so American that you're gay, attributing queerness and assimilation. And I was like, mom, that is very hurtful, but also maybe you should also be a writer because that's awesome. (laughs) You, you really read me for filth, but I was in such a dark space that I ran towards stand up. I ran towards doing comedy because it felt like doing comedy when I was drowning. It felt like I was breathing in and I was inhaling. So for me, when it comes to my writing, it feels like I'm going to give you the pain and the medicine. You know, I'm going to not shy away from the difficult subjects when it comes to like homophobia or when it comes to, you know, obviously this immigrant journey or or when it comes to like racist school systems. We're going to talk about all those things, but we're going to do it through jokes so that I don't re-traumatize the person that's watching but i also give myself the story that i deserved you know i wrote a script where the father is accepting of his queer son that is not what i had but i wanted to give myself the father that i deserved and that feels like a lot of my journey it comes from stories about kids who are forced to grow up and how i'd like to think about it is that i have to laugh at a funeral that feels like a tone that i love which is like it's so difficult this pain is so big that I need to find a way to laugh at it before it destroys me. So that feels like the tone that I love when it comes to my writing. Always super gay also. Super gay, super immigrant, super brown, super, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, same. You always tweet out, and I love, this is my favorite tweets. Out of everything you tweet, this is my favorite tweet that you will put out occasionally, that you are built on community love. And with that, I want to ask you, who are some of the writers that you're a fan of? And these could be heroes, peers, friends, people you creep on Twitter who don't know who you are, but you're obsessed with them. I mean, they probably do know who you are, but... but you are being too nice to me, sir. I like that it's registering <laughs> as nice. Um, hey. uh, <laughs> so who are some of those people? Going back to, I mean, that community love came from Linda Ivet Chavez, came from Marvin Lemus, came from... All the folks that gave me a shout out on this podcast, you know, Carlos Cisco and Eddie Mujica, David Tripler, Chris Carmona, 
the community love also came from Alejandra uh, Gracia, which is not Garcia. She makes it very clear. Um, yes. Who just became the writer's assistant on Gordita Chronicles. Uh, Steph Osuna Hernandez. Stefo, who was my pal through All of Hentified, who was a showrunner's assistant for Marvin and Linda, and is now a project involved fellow who's directing my close friend from film school, the only other Latinx person in, in my film school uh, production side, Gina Marie Hernandez, who just got a wavelength grant uh, to make her short film Chicks. Dominic Colon, who literally took me to my first gay bar, literally like picked Junior and, and brought it to New York for the HBO New York Latino Film Festival. That is my house mother, uh, how he would call himself, Jen Gomez and Raul Martin who taught me how to be a script coordinator and did not let me fail. Case Peña, I just got to work with her on a project and she was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I made a list because I was like, if this is the Oscar speech, these are all the people that I'm thanking for for showing me love. And I'm sure there's a lot more folks who took me in, but these were the folks who who I remember just today. <laughs> but tomorrow I'll, I'll be like, fuck, I should have mentioned this person. You should consider yourself very lucky. A lot of people see your success and they feel like they're a part of it. And you have a lot of people in your corner and, you know, could, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy because that's very nice. I'm serious. I'm serious. Cause I listen, the tweets are funny and, and it's like a little bit of the game and all this stuff, but it's also like, you are just being yourself and it's appreciated. The journey is appreciated. I appreciate that. No, I think it takes work to be yourself. It's easier to perform. I think I performed a long time. I mean, I was in the closet. I mean, I was, this like I thought that I had made it and you know all these things I was performing and right now I'm starting to like strip all that down and realize that like myself is good enough myself is allowed in a room and is, is worthy of being there um so yeah <laughs> I feel very lucky for those who don't know where can they follow you on social media it's at I am Fran Cabrera so that's at I am F-R-A-N-C-A-B-R-E-R-A only on Twitter I really dislike instagram um i'm slowly thinking about deactivating it um and it's also i privated it i was like i need to i need something for myself but twitter i'm there talking shit letting folks know that i support them and that i i i'm excited to meet them and so i like to have my guests help me title the episode the prompt is a blank and it could be latinx latine latina latino sometimes i feel like people think they have to say latinx they don't writer so in that blank, you put as many words as you want. You can mix it all around, just whatever feels true to you, this conversation, your writing. But I also use it as a community building tool. So when people see the, the title, they can be like, oh, that's like me. There's someone else like me doing the thing. I should listen to this. I should check this person out. I thought about this um, <laughs> a little bit, but I'm like, does this apply anymore? But how I'd like to think of myself as a writer is that I would be a so sad it's funny, baby queer Latinx writer. Perfect. Love it. <laughs> awesome. So with that, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. I feel like this episode was like at the same time, so long overdue, but also very premature. So um, I'm very excited for the next thing that comes out. I'm ready for this episode.